<coughs> Let's make some application now that we're kind of learning a little bit. We're learning a little bit of organic chemistry. So and that's what we'll work on. That's all. We'll kind of finish up this week, really, and then we'll, believe it or not, kind of start thinking about getting ready for the next test. I know it happens super fast, but... Okay, so here's what we're going to try and do. We're going to try and make some sense out of this business. Then I'll show you a little bit of reaction, just some react, some organic reactions. And we're off to the races. All right. So, alkanes, which means what? Are these guys alkanes or are these alkenes? Okay, so we're going to just talk about alkanes for a second. They're basically odorless, mild odor, they're colorless, tasteless, non-toxic. Now, the main thing is that they're insoluble in water, okay? But they're, but they're soluble in other things that look like them. So one, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about this today a little bit, but the idea is I'm going to show you something in the structure so you can start to understand state and rate. So you can understand, hey, if I look at these structures, I go, oh, these things will dissolve in each other, or they might be solid at room temperature. It's kind of wild you can do that just by looking at the structure a little bit. All right? But beyond that, the alkanes, as I've told you, is really the backbone of the chemical, so they don't do much, except you burn them sometimes. Yeah? So that reaction, very easy. This has four carbons in it. It's called butane, right? And if I react it with oxygen, that's a reaction I want you guys to learn because it's the combustion reaction. And every organic alkane does that. So it's gasoline in your car, diesel in your car, jet fuel, if you flew in that way. Right? It all runs the same reaction. This stuff hits oxygen, makes carbon dioxide and water. And we'll talk about that. We'll get that down pat today a little bit. Okay? So. So here we go. I'm doing it right now. Any hydrocarbon. So it doesn't even matter if it's alkenes and alkynes. Any kind of hydrocarbon, when it hits oxygen, it can make carbon dioxide and water. Okay? Or if it's incomplete, it makes, does anybody know what it make if it doesn't burn properly? Carbon monoxide and water. So this is the same reaction. It looks a little bit different. But if I did butane, and this is what I want you guys to learn. You just pick it up and just go, OK, I know it's burning. I know it's a hydrocarbon. It's reacting with So help me out a little bit. Butane, that's that stuff right there. How many carbons? Four. Okay, here we go. So I'm just going to draw it out so it looks efficient. One, two, three, four. Right? Now let's figure out how many car uh, carbons and hydrogens it has. You ready? Four carbons. You okay with that? How many hydrogens? Take a minute. Ten. 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 Okay, cool. And some of you remember the little trick, right? Times two, times two plus two is a good trick. But if not, you can count it out and go, okay, that's a CH3, CH2, CH2, CH3, 10. Good stuff. Anytime it burns with complete combustion, it makes, and this is liquid, actually it's gas, to be fair. How do I know? Because when I open it up, I can't see it. But if you look, if you get this in the right spot, do you see it coming out of the screen? Do you see the butane coming out of there? So it's there, right? So that's butane. And then when you ignite it with oxygen, it actually makes carbon dioxide and water, which are also gases. And this is, this is a lot more dramatic. Do you see all that carbon dioxide and water flowing out of there? back on the screen, okay? So we're going to do this. There you go. And 
And if it burned with incomplete combustion, which it is a little bit, and I always tell you guys this, this is worth knowing. If they're burning a little improperly, they're a little yellow. And if they're burning properly, they're blue. So this isn't great, like if, you know, if you're like stranded in the car and you turn on the candle and you kind of get that yellow flame or whatever, it's not that great. You get a little carbon monoxide out of that, which is poisonous. But if you bl burn it blue, that's perfect because that means it's fully oxidized. Okay? So now I'm going to just show you the other. This is called complete combustion. And then incomplete. C4H10. So too. You guys told me it makes carbon monoxide, and this stuff is poisonous. And water. And I'm always fascinated because people will say, you know, if you look at, you know, even they might even talk about it in the text or whatever, and they'll go, carbon monoxide is so poisonous that usually by the time you detect it, like the effects of it, you're about to die, and you can't smell it. So I'm just like, wow, which dead guy did they ask if you could smell it or not? Because I, I don't know if that's true or not. I mean, that's a little more. But anyway, here we go. I'm going to show you a little more on this because I'm going to get you guys used to something. I have how many carbons over here? Four. How many do I have over here? Two. One, right? So it's like I actually lost some carbon somewhere, and that never happens. So I'm going to show you something called balancing the equation. It kind of shows you the recipe. And the way you work that out is you kind of work left to right. We'll work this skill for a while until you guys get this down. But what you do is you work left to right, and any time that something's not right, like that should be four, I can fix it by, but I can't change the compound. It's carbon dioxide. I can't mess with that, it's carbon dioxide. I can do this though. And now the carbons are correct. Agreed? Then what I do, and this is the method, I start here, first thing I come to, I check it, if it's not right, I fix it, and then I go back and start all over again. Carbons are fine. How's my hydrogen? 10. How many you got over here? Two. So what should I put in front to make it right? Five. Five. Okay. Then I restart again. Carbon's good. Hydrogen's good. Oxygen good. How many do I have here? This will take me a minute. Two. Three. Eight. Three. How many out of here? Oh, no. All together. Five. So that's 13, right? So I can fix it if I put a number in here that would equal 13. What times 2 is 13? 6.5. 6.5. Now if I check it, everything's correct. That's that. Right? So now my rep, but do you understand what I was doing? Like, you, until you do it with your own hands, it, it feels weird, but it's... it's Perfectly, it'll always work out. You just start here, make it right, then restart again. I went to hydrogens, they weren't right, so I fixed it. Then I restarted. And I got to oxygens, they weren't right, so I fixed it. And the only way I fix it is put a number in front. I never adjust the formula because the formula is correct. All right, so we can practice on this bottom one. Now, if I'm going to be real meticulous, then a lot of times people don't like fractions in here. And that's easy, you just multiply everything through by the number to get rid of that. So I can just go through by two. And, and, and analyzing <laughs> by intermolecular force, which one would have the highest attraction to each other. So just, I, I, I want to make sure you kind of get this, because I, right? These are molecules, you can't see them, so it's very small. So it's just these concepts, right? So when I think about the boiling point of something, I'm thinking about that something and something just like it, so water molecules. And you think about a boiling, they're <laughs> stuck together through something. Now we know that something's called a hydrogen bond, right? So they're stuck through space. There's an electronic attraction. Just like magnets grab magnets, right? I mean, they grab through space through electro electrostatic force field. So the question is, if that strength is strong, then that means it's harder to boil and make it gaseous, right? 
Or if I say that strength is strong and it's locked in the crystal and I go, that's what melting point is. So if that strength is strong, then that's a higher melting point. I have to heat it more before it melts. Right? So I look at materials and I go, oh, that's liquid. Well, that meant it's already melted. So, you know, at room temperature, there's enough energy in the room. It's already melted. But something solid, oh, like the plastic on this. You're like, it's holding together strong enough that if I can heat it a little more, it might melt and come together. I mean, that's just rough explanation of things. Is everybody okay with that? Now, that's all we're doing. Like, that's all we worked on when we were together last is like, this is pretty, it's kind of higher level, but you guys got this, right? I mean, it's just like, oh, wait, there's a system. Look for these three things. H-bond dipole dispersion. So who can help me say, oh, I look up and see an H-bond. What would I see? OH. OH is one. NH. NH. FH. FH. That's it in the structure. Those are the strongest. And I could say, oh. And if I was being specific with numbers, that's a strength of about 10. 10 kilojoules for every mole. Now, if I went to the next level, I'd say, oh, it might have a dipole. What do you see in the structure that says, hey, dipole? Right? We clarified this a little more, right? Because I kind of had it, well, yeah, you were being very specific, Dr. T, and then you kind of nailed me on that, which I appreciate. Where at the periodic table? It's kind of in that corner, right? So start with, give me some elements and I'll track with the laser. Where are we at here? Where, where should I start? Yeah. Hydrogen. Hydrogen? Would that, a hydrogen be present in a dipole? No. no. Okay, where's the big ticket? N. N. Perfect. Okay. N. O. O. F. F. C. B. R. I. That's cool. And that's good. So I look up there and I see that and I go, ooh. That's connected to carbon or hydrogen. It's enough to make a difference, to make a dipole. Second in strength, right? And then everything else has what's called dispersion. And again, that's a very, remember we were doing that little, it's a very wimpy, like I wouldn't trust fall with a sing, single dispersion force because it's like, hey, I'm going off the cliff with that, right? That ain't going to help me. But if I, right? And that would say any atom. So now when we think about carbon chains like this, we just go, Every point on here represents a dispersion force. So if I have more points, and see how I'm doing a point? Don't wake up in the middle of the night and go, oh, he called carbon and two hydrogens, that's three atoms, a point. That's not fair. Just It's easier with hydrocarbon chains to think about every carbon kink in the chain as one point. Because when I show you the model, you see they kind of stick like that, right? The carbon chains represent the points. And it makes your, your life easier. And it's true. I mean, it works. It's just, I know this from experience, so I'm just teaching you this shortcut way without trying to analyze every hydrogen involved, right? It's like, man. Is that okay? So now it's easy because I can say how many points of attraction? One, two, three, four, five. I just do the carbon chain links, right? That makes it easy. Yeah. So for the hydrogen bond, if there's multiple hydrogen bonds, that's those are cumulative. It's not just yes. like for E, it's two. So she's saying E has two hydrogen bonds. That yes. 10, 10 kilojoules of attraction is now 20. 20 right there. She is exactly right. And this is, does anybody see a dipole on here? A. a. There's only one, so that's a five. If I had two of them, it'd be 10. If I had three of them, it'd be 20. And that's what I showed you. I showed you a very, very simple three carbon structure with three OHs, and it was a gooey. Like I was pouring, and it was like thick. Because it's only three carbons long, but it's on its way to becoming solid almost. Because it had three hydrogen bonds in it. Perfect. Okay, with all that pre-explanation, oh, we better get the last two points, because that's it. You're, you're on track, I love it. Like H-bond, he's the champ, dipole's in the middle, dispersion's the least, 
And then I had little details of like, okay, I get two dispersions, how do I discriminate between them, right? Between like B and C, that's only dispersion only, correct? I don't see any fancy, no H-bonds, everybody agree or any questions there? No dipoles, nothing out of the list you said. So one of these is higher than the other and why? D because it has branching. Yeah, now branching, does that make the force go up or down? Down is what they're saying. Down. Can we clarify that in our head? Remember what we're trying to do is this, get them close, right? They, they got a grab. What does branching do to things getting close? Prevents it. Now, if is that obvious to people or you need to see it with molecules, you need explanation? Anybody do yard work? Yard work? Yeah. Lots. Where are you going, Dr. T? Because you're crazy. What do you say yard work for? When you stack the branches and you leave them branched in the back of your truck, it's a zoo. You get 10 branches in, I'm ready to go. I got a full bed. You cut the branches and make them flat and bundle them. <coughs> Hundreds of branches now going, correct? Same idea. When you get them flat, they stick very nicely together, correct? Which what we're talking about means higher boiling point, higher melting point. Correct? So that's what, what this com, com, comment is. If your branching's going up, your melting point, the strength is going down. But if the chain link's going up, then the strength's going up. Right? Just It's a longer chain, more points of attraction. Okay, cool. Now, enough of that. I want us to rank these out. So I need a little bit of help. We're going to put numbers like, say, here's the champ. We'll call him number one, the one that's the strongest intermolecular force. Since this is the strongest, I keep saying him, but we'll call it her because she's the strongest. Right? Looking around my class, I'm like, I'm about to get thrown out. Right? <laughs> I better be careful. Okay, so you guys look up here and see, okay, I, I'm going to rank this and say, here's the strongest. But when you do that, will somebody also say, and you said it, how many of these do you want to put on here? Two, two H bonds. So put it off to the side. Two H bonds. Okay? And then somebody go, okay, I knew who's next and here's why. I see. And then just make notes and let's see if we can rank these out. Do you want to, since we kind of, will you grab number one and make a note on it? And then somebody get ready from over here, grab number two. What you think number two is. All of you work together, see what you think that ranking is. Do you want me to work with me? Yeah, you can ask. But I think we all talk about it. Yeah, that's cool. Take a minute. And then you'll get number two. You guys ready? So you talk amongst yourself and see what you think number two is. Right? We got a few. So you guys can do three. Just why not here? You're right by each other. So you can get three. You can get four, and then this, you guys can take number five. Is that right? Do I have enough? Okay, perfect. Yeah, and if you'll put it right under the structure itself. Oh, sorry. Yeah, that's number one, two H bars. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So good, you guys. This is you guys are good stuff. I teach this across all my classes because it's critical to how things like predicting state, and it's also critical to predicting rate. That's what I taught you guys, but it's also critical to dissolving stuff in other stuff, and it's like a backbone. It's the funniest thing, like, literally when I worked, like a PhD research chemist, half your day sometimes it's like, hey, what will dissolve this? Like, that was the most important question. And you're like, that's silly. But just think of it this way, let's just say I made some new medicine, and it's floating around in the thing I made it, I have to go in and grab it out. That's why I, you care about what dissolves what. 
So in chemistry, sometimes that is the ticket. Like, what dissolves what? Because I've got something valuable, I gotta fish it out of stuff. Okay? <coughs> so that's, I mean, the first bet, I'm sorry, this is the first thing that comes to mind, but I think about like the medical marijuana industry, they're like, how could I get THC out? Or something else important to you guys, coffee. How can I sneak in and get caffeine out? Like I gotta make sure it's a it's a pot of coffee. I leave, you know, I wanna do decaf. Okay, how do you sneak in and pull caffeine selectively out? That's what this is all about. Does that help? Kind of give some importance? Man, you guys, this is so good. Two H bonds, one H bond, and how many dipoles, by the way? Oh, one. One, perfect. Yep, I agree. What's next? Chain, Chain is straight. In other words, same. By the way, and the other thing I would do here is I, I'd go like one, two, three, four, five. That's five carbons. One, two, three, four, five. Oh, that's five carbons. So as far as chain length, it's kind of the same. And then this one's branched. That's perfect. Now with that in mind, can I now start answering these questions? So you guys all help me. Now, now, this is strength, right? This is the amount of attraction. So now when I go lowest boiling point, which one should I pick? Yeah. Now you got, this one's tricky. Vapor pressure will get you if you don't think about it a little bit. Do you know how to do, now, are you guys getting comfortable with vapor pressure a little bit? It's this, you know, this is just my, it's just my water. It's like, yeah, I don't smell anything. Then I get this cleaner, which is alcohol, and I go, oh, oh, whoa. Right? That has vapor pressure. Right? Now, with, how does that relate to boiling point? It's opposites, right? If your boiling point's going down, you have a lot of vapor pressure. If it boils at a low temperature, it has a lot of vapor pressure. If it boiled at room temperature, it would be all gas. True? So all I have to do is think about boiling point and go, eh, it's opposites. Right? So, so based on that, <coughs> where's the lowest vapor pressure? D again? No, no, E. E? Correct. Highest boiling point, lowest vapor pressure. Now this is where you get, okay. Freezing point. What's the highest freezing point? Which by the way, that sometimes confuses me. So you know what I do in my head? I just go, I go melting. To me, it makes better sense. I'm trying to melt it. more energy to melt, right? That's higher melting point. Same point, right? Ice melts at zero, ice freezes at zero. You tracking? Okay. So, with that in mind, what's the highest freezing point? E. e. So, now what's second highest freezing point? See, there you go. So that'll take a minute to get used to that. But you'll get practice with that. Perfect. That's all I'm after. Just give yourself a hand. That's pretty good. I mean, Chem 2, Organic Chemistry, they're doing this. It's hard. But you guys, like, nailed it. Perfect. All right. Let's move on. Last. This is crazy. We're already to the last part of the unit. So the next question would probably be, gosh, when does that mean we're taking a test? Correct? So the way I would do it is I'd say, let's finish this today. Let's go do a little bit of a review on Tuesday. And then let's open the test up the following week. So two weeks from Tuesday, it should open. I mean, two weeks from Monday it should open. Does that make sense? We walk in here on Monday, we do a review, we then have a full week to work on that material and then take the exam. 
and I can either open it the same way I did the last time. Like instead of going Monday, Tuesday, I'll go Tuesday, Wednesday. So should I check that real quick? Uh, who wants the Monday, Tuesday opening versus the Tuesday, Wednesday opening? Okay, so Monday, Tuesday opening. I got one, two, three, four. Tuesday, Wednesday opening. Okay, so it'll open Tuesday, Wednesday. Is that all right? Now, if any time I say that, and you literally are like, I am paying for school and working as a dental technician, I work Tuesday, Wednesday, 10 hour days, then pull me aside and we'll have a talk and we'll figure something out. Is that okay? Let's make sure. But don't pull me aside if it's like, I'm going to some rock concert on Wednesday night. I don't, you know, I'm sorry. <laughs> I can't help you with that. Okay, awesome. Appreciate you guys. This is great. Let's do this. Last topic. It's time. This is so cool. We are now. We kind of revisit organic. Use it over. That's it. That's kind of the organic. You just did it. I know. You learn how to name. You know how to do functional groups. Obviously, I don't push you into memorizing all those. Right? I don't know. I don't push you into memorizing how to name everything. We did what? Three reactions? And if you're in your mind going, what, what was that? Complete combustion? Right? Incomplete combustion? And then we did a reaction where we had hydrogen across the double bonds. Which I'll review, I'll review again today, but I just want to remind you that if I had an alkene and I added hydrogen across the double bonds, what would it become? Say it a little louder. Okay. It becomes an alkane. It went from a double to a single bond. It puts the hydrogen across the double bond. So I, I can do that. Who knows the materials to make that happen? Well, what is it I'm adding across the double bond? That's your first hint. Hydrogen. Okay, well, there's one material. I can't add hydrogen across the double bond if I don't add hydrogen. I mean, I'm not trying to, but you get it, right? But there's something special that makes this work. A catalyst. Can you name the catalyst? I want you to know that group. Can I? Can I just? Put Halogens. My, it's somewhere in this neighborhood. Did anybody know what the name? The, yeah. What numbers? Give me a number. And I'll, 28. 46. 78. That group. Hydrogenation guys. Kind of weird they also add oxygen across hydrocarbon. And, and well a lot of you guys have platinum in your your mufflers. And when you heat it up and gasoline comes trickling out. In other words, you have unburnt gasoline instead of spilling it on the ground and that becoming uh, in the air and really kind of screwed up our atmosphere. It goes out your hot muffler and it touches platinum and it burns, it ignites immediately. Now obviously it doesn't blow up like where you blow your muffler apart, but it's burning, it's burning in a safe way. So that's how you prevent, we used to drive cars around and then we'd be kind of pouring gas all out. Trace amounts, but when it adds up across all the cars, there's screw on that. Right? So, so that's why people started stealing mufflers because platinum's worth a lot of money. They're still in the catalytic converters. Catalyst converting gasoline to gasoline and oxygen makes carbon dioxide and water. <laughs> it just burnt. It's post burning. Perfect. All right, cool. All right, here we go. Enough of that. Probably ought to put my little widget in. Then we can start talking about the new stuff. All right. Let's just, yeah, let's get into it. You just did well on what you just did. Now we're going to just try and get you thinking about 
Um, the way things attract themselves, right, that determines state. And then you also kind of learn, hey, especially chain length and branching, that gets in the way of rate, right? So as the chain gets longer, how does the rate of reaction tend to happen with that organic chemical? Slows down. And if I increase the branching, what's going to happen to the rate of reacting that? Slows down. Okay? So the part I didn't really talk about is how it affects binding something else. So now you got to kind of shift your thinking and go, okay, you know, we talked about how something bonds to itself, but now we're going to talk about how something bonds to something else. And I've introduced this loosely with you guys because I said, hey, look, water's polar and it can dissolve salt. Right? And the, the key here is like dissolves like. That's the key. This is what you say in organic chemistry all the time. Like, like dissolves like. Hey, I gotta get the caffeine out of the copy. What's caffeine made of? And I start identifying chain link, carbon, hydrogen bond, blah 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 blah. Once I see the structure, I go, aha, I want something that's like caffeine. Like dissolves like. Follow? So I'm going to be very specific about what I think like is. So we got some things, and this is kind of a, you know, maybe these aren't the, my favorite slides, but I just want to kind of remember that if you had an ion, so that means anything ionically bound, that's all ionic compounds, what we call salts. They have charges, positive and negative, right? That's what makes them stick. Those would all be attractive to anything that has a dipole. Make sense? Because the dipole would stick to it. So if I have salt sitting here, water will stick to it. And if I have a little bit of water, you know, it's like an ant walking up to an elephant. Like, I'm gonna eat you. And he's like, yeah, right. Right? But if the entire army of army ants shows up, the elephant's like, oh crap, I'm in trouble, right? Because it will eat that elephant. Because water's like that too. It sticks on the salt. And more waters, more waters, more waters, and finally you break the salt apart. Because energy-wise, it's kind of about 40 kilojoules per mole. Remember, if it was just hydrogen bond, hydrogen bond, you'd go 10. But hydrogen bond attracting to this strong positive charge is a little stronger. It's 40. And then the salts are bound to each other with like 200 kilojoules. So they're very hard to break apart. But if I, got, if, if I get enough waters, it'll break it apart. Does that make sense? So I would certainly be thinking anything with a dipole can dissolve the salt. So now you can just go, oh, hydrogen bond, dipole, dispersion, no, not enough. Does that help? So if I'm looking to dissolve salt, I'm looking for something that's got an H bond or a pole. A dipole, sorry, that's the term you're using. H bonds dissolve other H bonds. H bonds, of course, dissolve other dipoles. Dipoles dissolve other dipoles. I just think of it this way. Hey, if you got a charge, you'll dissolve something with a charge. So what gives rise to a charge? Ions. H bonds and dipoles. These all group together. Then the other side of things is dispersion. Dispersion dissolves dispersion. Like dissolves like. Is that okay? So if I had some gasoline spilled, I would want to pick it up with something that looks like gasoline. All right. So here's my handles. And then again, you know, if I'm dissolving, the better it dissolves is the more points of traction can come in any of these cases. Right? So if I have, you know, the, the glycerol that had multiple hydrogen bonds, that's, a, that's awesome for dissolving salt because it has lots of dipoles. All right. So again, I'm going to just show this picture. Here's my salt bound very strongly to each other. Those are true ionic bonds, those are chemical bonds. Here's my water, and it's going to start moving around in surrounding parts. It would make sense what the way it orients, right? It goes, hey, that's positive sodium, so the negative part of the water reaches out to grab it. 
this is positive or negative chlorine, so the positive part of the water tries to attract to it. And it just starts picking it up in pieces. And that's why salt dissolves the water. What's wrong with my picture? Well, probably not enough water. I just, it would be too cluttered. It's probably more like 18 waters for every one <coughs> plus. And then do you guys realize there's a limited solubility for salts for water? Right? If I start putting water in salt water, when it's full, you could just pour salt and it just goes to the bottom and no, it no longer dissolves. It's like, because remember, you got to outnumber the salts with waters. Okay? And so if you look up salts, they say there's a, there's a solubility. 10 grams per 100 mils or something, right? It tells you how soluble salts are in water. All right, is that all making sense? Got this concept? So let's mix these. There's my water, and there's my pentane. Now I'm just going to ask if I mix, would they bond with each other? Are they alike? You think they're going to mix? Give me a thumbs up. You say, eh, they're not alike. Give me a thumbs down. Yeah, yeah. What's, what's wrong with pinting? What, is it, what kind of forces are present in it? Dispersion. Dispersion only. What kind of forces are present in water? H-bonds. H-bonds. They have poles. So, not going to happen. So, it's hydrophobic. Okay, what about this one? There's water. You know that? This is fingernail polish remover. It's acetone. But you guys might get a, a better name for it. You ready? How many carbons do you see? Three. 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 So what, what's in the name? You start to try, but not, not with the organic name. You're close. Help her out. Probe. This is propanone. The presence of a ketone is an unknown. Nothing you should know, right? Except the probe part. That's all you should know. But anyway, I, I digress. Help me out. Think they'll dissolve? No. Does this have any kind of poles? No. Yes. What kind? Yeah, so what's the giveaway? I go, oh, wait, wait, that is, okay, let's break it down. H-bonds? No. no. Dipoles? Yes, thank you. Thank you for that confidence. Yes, I see an oxygen. That's one of those seven, right? That's a dipole. Dipoles are charged, right? H-bond? Yes. yes or no? Yes. Yes. Is it charged? Like, dissolved <coughs> like. Absolutely. Those have charges, they bond to each other, true, but they could certainly bond to each other. I'm sorry, I just kind of tried, it takes a minute to get this right, but you get the idea. The positive end of this, right, that's the negative, that's the positive, would certainly reach out and grab the negative end of this water. And that would dissolve it, like dissolves like. Acetone will go into water. That's what you use. Some of you guys might use F acetate for bringing up polish remover. But either way, if you want, you can play with it at the house and put it in water and see what happens. All right. We'll try this. Ions, H bonding, dipoles. These are alike. Dispersion only. Now, I'll give you two words. This would be great to put in your vocabulary. Ready? Hydrophilic. I'm a water lover. These are all hydrophilic. Water lovers. These are hydrophobic. They're water fearing. They hate water. Everything in the dispersion group is called hydrophobic. Everything in the dipole, ion, or H bond is hydrophilic. They're water lovers. Make sense? All right. Here's a list. You guys ready to practice? Let's figure out where they go. I'm putting water as a solvent. That's water lover. I'm choosing pentane as my solvent. What's pentane mean? Who can do the structure? Five carbons. 
One, two, three, four, five. Okay, that's a good thing, correct? It's like a seagull. Maybe a osprey. Any, any bird lovers in here? Never seen an osprey in the. It's actually got a bend in its wings. I thought he was like, oh, that's that's a hawk. That's an eagle. Oh, that's an osprey because it's like these things are crazy. They're the ones that fold their wings and then just take fish like. But they can really dive into the water and come back out, which is crazy watching. Anyway, do you see there's no H-bonds, no dipoles, no ions? This is just dispersion only. That's what this means. Okay, you guys ready? We'll walk along. First row, you three, you ready? Where do you think this is going to go? If I was, would it want to go in here or would it want to go down here? Is it a water lover or is it a water hater? What is it? Water hater, what? It dissolves. Well, if it, if it dissolves, it's water lover. So does salt dissolve in water? Yeah. Why? Because it's charged, right? Those are ions. Does that make sense? Ions have charge? So I just, in fact, in my notes, I'd say, hey, if it's ionic, it's a water lover. Okay. That goes into this category. Whoop, it's under here. All right. Ready? Second row, you guys, you three ready? What about this thing? Hey, break it down. Does it have an H bond? Does it have a dipole? Then where's it gonna go? It's a water heater. It's gonna have a charge to go in water. No charge. That's methane. So it's going down. Cool. Get the fuel now. All right, you guys ready? Methanol. Ooh, ooh. That, that, re that requires a little bit of our organic chemistry. What would you do with methanol? How many carbons? What does OL mean? Alcohol. Alcohol, okay, good. How many carbons? One? Cool. So if I was doing the structure, I'd put COH. Anything else if you want to add to it? How many hydrogens on this thing? Oh, wow. That's methanol. Okay. Water lover or water hater? Hydrophilic. There you go. Perfect. All right. This one's a little tougher. It's okay. It's good for you guys. You ready? Ooh! Now you you're not quite. We we did this a little bit. It's chloro attached to one carbon. You call that what's the root word of one carbon in organic? Yeah, perfect. It's, it's chloro methane, right? But because I have three chloros, remember when we had two, we'd say dye something. Now we have three, so we go. It's trichloromethane. Cool. Oh. Not that up. Yeah. Water lover or water hater and why? What's that? What why? What do you see in there? Yeah. What's the charge come from? Can I help you guys just sort it out? Is there an H bond? There is? Where's the H? The H between that and chlorine? Oh, no. No, that's an H and a carbon, right? Yeah. Oops, okay, that's not, it's not an H bond, right? Is it a dipole? Yes, because of what element? Chlorine. Chlorine, okay. That's all you need to do. You go, oh, that's a, that's a charge. Where's it gonna go? Hmm. Water. See how we're doing it? H bond dipole dispersion, just that simple. Don't make it harder than that. Ah, dipole, water. No dipole. Right? Okay. Down she goes. Or up she goes, sorry. You guys, you ready? What do you think about this stuff? Hydrochloric acid. Water what? Hydrophilic, water lover. Yeah, hydrophilic. It's a water lover. Absolutely. On the end, you three, I'm going to ask you something first. Can you name this thing? 
What is it? Yes, absolutely. Which way is it going? Down. In fact, it is pentane. Yeah, it's going to dissolve in itself. Yep, that's for sure. Cool. <coughs> what do you guys think about this one? Down. Down. Get down. Right? Okay. So if you started the name it, what would you say in the name? I got a cycle, so what do I do with that? How do I start to name that? Anybody help? Out loud? Cyclo. And how many carbons are in there? So we're going to call it cyclo. And we're almost done, except I now see double bonds, so then how do I end it? Teen, right? So, and if I'm being technical on this, I wouldn't ask that of you, but I'd go, well, I got to start numbering somewhere. So I'm, and I got a number through the double. It's a weird one. It's one, two, three. It's one, three cyclodipentene, because it has two enes in it. But you're right on the cyclopentene. You're right on track for what you guys need at this point. It's fine. It's good. And you think which way? Up or down? Down. Yeah, cool. Now, two pentene, if I was drawing it, what do you guys think? How many carbons should I put in? And then what do I do with two pentene? What do I have to do to adjust it? This guy's almost there. <coughs> How do I fix it and make it two pentene? Double bond from two to three. Which way is that thing going? Everybody let me know. Is it going up or is it going down? Okay, cool. All right, cool. Two butane. What the heck? How many carbons? One, two, three, four. Right? What does butane mean? Is it a triple? Where at? Almost two. Yep. And then if you redrew this, because we talked about this in class, it might even look like this, right? One, two, three, four, either one. This would be nice, because then I don't miss carbons, right? That's not very clear, sorry, that goes all the way through there. Is that better? Ah, meanwhile, down or up? Everybody? Down, down. Down, all right. Make sense? Now you understand like dissolves like. The next time something goes onto your carpet and somebody says, hey, how do I get out of there? Even if you Google with structure, you'll get a clue. I spilled this on the carpet. I'm like, oh, I need something that's oily or something, right? Depends what, you know, what you're trying to get out, but it's going to be carpet, it's going to have to have some sort of hydrophobic piece to it. And by the way, soaps have both, and we'll talk about that a little today. All right. You guys ready to jump into the last thing you guys do in this class? Now you might think, oh, we're about to finish on this unit. We're done. No. The way we do it is we keep repeating back through. You probably noticed that. We just kind of keep recycled, like we keep circling back through. We do, we do some conversion stuff. We do some organic, we introduce biochemistry, and then we just keep cycling back through. So when I get biochemistry, I ask you about organic functional groups, I'll ask you about attraction and solubility, and we'll just keep going through, and maybe some convergence here and there. And it just keeps, and then when you're done, you get all three of these together. Okay? So, let's talk about biochemistry. It's really exploring chemical processes related to biological systems. It's probably predominantly organic based. <coughs> like you'll need your functional group table out. You might want to pull it anyway. Is this going to be on the next list test? Yeah, that's it. Yeah, and it's just the, it's just the introduction part. Whatever we do today. Okay. Okay? So, you guys ready? If I broke it all apart, we're not doing all of this today. These are the four types of biomolecules. Something called carbohydrates, something called lipids, which we'll focus on today, something called nucleic acids, and something called proteins slash amino acids. Kind of the four main biomolecules.
ridiculous. It's like if I'm ta tasked with talking about general chemistry, the first thing I did, I'd probably say, well, yeah, it's all centered around ionic covalent bonding. Right? If I'm tasked with organic chemistry, then I generally say, hey, there's substrate, right, backbone, and functional group. That's what it's all about, really. If I introduce biochemistry, I generally say it's, it's all about these four groups. The detail behind it takes you about a year to just be introduced to properly. But we'll get it this semester. Just like organics, a full year and known as the hardest class you could take as an undergraduate, bar none. Okay? So, with that in mind, we're going to kind of introduce this. We're going to work on lipids today, and that'll be it for the exam. Okay? And we'll sneak back to that later. So, here we go. What I'm going to do as I do these groups, I'm going to basically give you a sense of. Here's how we do it overview-wise. We say, okay, of those groups, I'm going to try and tell you where it shows up. Like, okay, in my body, what, what do lipids do? Follow? And then, then when I talk about carbohydrates, okay, in my body, what do carbohydrates do? Then I'm going to say, okay, can you look at structures, now that you know a little organic chemistry, and say, <laughs> this is kind of the characteristic structure in a molecule, and you go, ah, that's a lipid. You look at the structure and go, ah, that's a carbohydrate. Look at that. Oh, that's a protein. I know by the structure. And then I'll teach you a little bit about maybe some of the naming if needed and some of the reactions that are pertinent to you. And that's kind of it. And that's how I'll go through all this stuff. All right? So let's talk about a lipid first off. Um, it's weird because the way it happened with the old chemists or grandpas of chemistry they didn't, they didn't know as much as we know. They couldn't see structure so well and all that. So what they did very simply is they said, if it's hydrophobic, it's a lipid. So in other words, they took bodies, ground them up. Okay, I'm exaggerating. Maybe cells. But ground them up and they said, okay, let's put some oil in there and see what uh, dissolves in the oil. Hydrophobic and comes out. That was all set off in the lipid category. But because of that, it kind of captured a few things that are pretty neat, like they're not the same thing. Is that okay? So, that's how it happened. So you can safely say this about lipids. They're hydrophobic. That's a yes, that is true. There are many great different types of lipids because of what I just explained, and they serve a variety of functions because of what I just explained. So of the groups, it's probably the most like, eh, <laughs> it's got a lot of categories. So we'll do the best. But again, right, that's another way of saying dispersion force only. Lots of car hydrocarbon chains. Is that, well, however you want to say that. I'm looking for big hydrocarbon chains. Non-polar regions, hydrophobic. All right. Now, if you inspect, like what if I look, I'm going to tell you this. Look for this above everything else. They may be in rings, or they may be in straight chains, but you're looking for big old hydrocarbon chains. And we're talking like big, like 20 carbons long. Big. And then sometimes they're in rings, so you might have like six, six carbon rings all locked together. But... But beyond that, there might be some small areas, some little bit of functionality here and there. So you might see some esters. <coughs> Look on your functional group, see what I mean when I say an ester. Somebody give me the details of an ester. Okay, so specifically, what do I see in an ester group? This thing, right? That's in a lot of things, correct? Now, what's up on either side of it is important, but what's on the nest? <coughs> oxygen and hydrogen. 
R root. That's what makes an S root. Because if I did this, what would I have made? It was a nester. What is this? Hmm. If it's all by itself, I'd agree with that. That's an alcohol. But when I see this connected, that is something different. There you go. Whoops. Carboxylic acid, which, by the way, is one of the things I'm looking for. So I went ahead and put it. Or alcohols, which is just this all by itself. That's the one you should know and should be able to name, right? Very nice. There we go. All make sense? All right, here we go. Here's a wax. Now, this is good because this would be, you can start thinking about what, what do lipids do? So, first off is waxes. Now, what's a wax? Like, what's a wax on my body? <coughs> That's how I protect my hair. Apparently, <laughs> didn't do its job. But, you know, like how you protect your hair. How about that? We'll just say that. Right? That There's waxes on there. There's wax on my skin. Right? I have protective waxes. That's why I'm waterproof. I am. You guys waterproof too? Yeah. Okay, good. That's good. Or even like feathers and stuff like on a duck, right? Those things are crazy waterproof. Right? Because they're sitting out there in a snowstorm like in the middle of the river like, oh, it's the best day ever. And you're like, what the heck? This is crazy, right? That's a wax that protects it. Right? So that's what that is. Beeswax. Waterproofing on burrs. Coatings on fur, right? Dogs are kind of a little more, depending on the breed, right? They actually have kind of a real important wax generation that keeps them waterproof and alive, yeah? So if I look at the structure, can you see what is that structure in there? The focus isn't really here because that's only one little piece, but if I asked you that function group, what would you say? Ester. Ester. But here's the big hydrocarbon chain. See how lazy we're getting? That's 15 carbons. This is how many carbons? 28. 30. That's a boatload of carbons, isn't it? Altogether, that's about 45 carbons in this structure. And it is hydrophilic or phobic? Phobic. Now you might look at this and go, wait, that's a water lover. Yes, this gets swamped out though by all this. True water would attract to that, but it's not enough to override all the hydrophobicity. So that's what happens there. All right, so so far we got waxes. All right, now this is the famous one. These, are, By the way, hey, if you want in your lipids, you can also say fat. You know, like we sometimes just say, hey, fat, storage fat, 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 right? We're talking about lipids. And the famous thing is the triacylglycerides, and those are energy storage. That's like long term. I put on some fat in the winter, right? Because I have to burn more calories, or if I'm just surviving, I'll cut into my fat supply, right? That's long term energy storage. Insulation, like literally keeping me warm. And then protection. Now, what does that mean, protection? How does fat protect me? Protects your organs. Yeah, you actually have fats around like your hearts and stuff. So when, you know, somebody comes up, you just like, I'm fine. <laughs> As opposed to, oh, I'm having a heart attack. You just punch me in the heart, right? I mean, it's just, it protects you. Your brain from the shock, right? The fats make kind of a protective cushion around stuff. Look at that structure. What are you seeing in that? Again, again, I don't want you to miss. I got it in yellow. How many carbons in here? 15. How many in here? Oof. Yeah, 17. And look, what's that guy? The bond. And there you go. Now, I can't see the structure on here. But if I knew this, and I looked at it, and I went, oh, of those 17, the chain that leaves like this. Uh oh, careful. I'm telling you, that could be a bad day for me. Right? <laughs> it's like, yeah. Better to get a screen cut and fix that. What is this? 
specifically, why am I doing this way versus this way, which is this. Oh, okay. Sis, and this one's trans. Cool. Okay, good. Yay. That's simple that in this particular fat, I, I can't tell it. I don't know which it is, right? This didn't give detail. It's either cis or trans, though. And that's important because that's a trans fat or a cis fat. Got it? What's it? What else is in this little structure? Esther. Esther, yep. And that's just vegetable oil, cooking oils. All, in fact, most of, most of the oils you think of, like, oh, I'm using avocado oil, I'm doing all that oil. I'm, that's, some, that's some variation of these. With or without double bonds, with or without different chain links. That's what that's all about. Triisoglycerides. All right? Little functionality. Lots of esters and hydrophobic region. And that's the giveaway that it's in the lipid family. Cool? This is a saturated fat. That's an unsaturated fat. Saturated on top, right? No doubles or triples. I got a double or triple bond that's a saturated or an unsaturated on the bottom. Does that make sense? And just so you know, we're not to it yet, but when we get to carbohydrates, we'll go, that also is energy for the body. But they say gram for gram, these have twice the caloric content of the carbohydrate. That's why they're long time storage. Does that make sense? They just have a lot more energy content per gram. Cool. Now I like this protection. This is good. I'm glad I pointed this out. I said protection both times, but I wanted to be more specific. Wax is a protection from chemical. Like if I get something on my hand, I have a minute with the wax to protect me. I pick up a base. By the way, if this happens, this is a, a good rule of thumb. If I'm in a chem chemical lab and I touch something and it feels slick, and I'm like, oh, that's slick. I can guarantee you that's probably a base and it's burning through your wax right now. So go to the sink and start washing with soap and water right away. And like if you're washing with ammonia or you get around oven cleaner, you'll have the same effect. You'll be like, oh, slick. And then if you leave it on, it's going to start burning your hands. Why? Because that waxy layer is protecting you and giving you time. Like, go take care of this. But if you let it go, it will burn through the wax ultimately, and then you'll be in trouble. But you understand the wax gives me a level of protection which I then wash with soap and water and it's gone, right? So that's cool. All right. You will hear the term fatty acid. And so that term has to do with, this gets broken down, this triacylglyceride, nothing new here, it's the one we just did. But you break it down right here in this area and you split it out and you do this. Now what is the structural group? Sorry, these didn't match really pretty, but it's it's a C double bond OH and a C double bond. What is that called? Almost. Hey, I, I want to help with the alcohol piece. Always look at the alcohol and look back. If it's combined with a C double bond O, no longer an alcohol. Does that help? If it's bound back to just straight carbon chain, alcohol. Does that help? So now once I see this, I go, oh no. Now i got to look on my chart and say, well, what is that as a unit, C double bond OH? That's the carboxylic acid. So we call those fatty <coughs> acids. The acid part here, the fatty part there. And this is very common that somewhere in between being a, you know, a lipid triacylglyceride, it could get broken apart into fatty acids or vice versa. So can try, so try, try Acyl glycerides, glycerols. It's the same name. It's interchangeable with, with the I. Yes, there. thank you. I'm so glad you're in the class. She helps me. Okay. I'm just confused. Well, and that's why. Because as chemists, we roll, we roll back and forth amongst these things, and we forget to go, you know, for my student, that's going to be confusing as heck. I apologize. Glyceride and glycerol are a loose. They're the same thing. Okay. And it's awful. Right? It never should happen. It just does, and I'm sorry. 
So triacylglycerides and triacylglycerols are interchangeable. They mean the same thing. Thank you for pointing that out. If you ask me why, I don't know. Like why they ever got so lax with this. And the same thing will happen up. You'll hear glycerol or glycerol, same thing. It's poor, poor chemistry. Thank you for coming. Because the all is supposed to equal that it has a, has a alcohol. alcohol, but it doesn't in this case, so that's really okay. even more crappy. <laughs> now, the nature of it is this, though, because what happens at the end of this reaction? It makes glycerol. And truly, you guys know this though, the proper name would be what? How many carbons? <coughs> three. three, and you would call it one, two, three, prope triol, because it's got three alls in it. But you don't have to know that much. You would know the prope and all, you would, that would give you enough. I'm not gonna ask you to do triols and diols. And, but you got it? Okay. Cool. So, but when you hear fatty acids, think about this. Carboxylic acid on one thing and then that big long hydrocarbon chain. Okay? They're, they're useful for transport. So quite often if you, you digest a lot of, of the um, fat, uh, sorry, I'm just checking my, what should I, I can help you guys get the break whenever the time comes. There it is, okay. If you have triacylglycerols, right, they break down into fatty acids in your digestion and then they move throughout the body a little easier. Or sometimes I consume those in different things and then my body can reconstruct them into fats in the body, however I want to use them. So there's kind of a back and forth between these fatty acids and then being back connected in the triacylglycerols. Okay? Or ite. One, right? There you go. So, let's learn a couple things. They break down by hydrolysis, to hydrolysis so I'm going to teach you one little reaction. This is going to make sense to you. Hydrolysis. Let's talk about that for a minute. So we're going to go back here for a minute. <coughs> what is this? Water. water. So hydrolysis, hydrate, right? It's adding water across bonds. So I'm going to show you how that happens. Here was the original bond, right? And so I'm going to break this apart. I'm just going to show you how this happens. There's the break. I just show you that. I'll just break it like that. I'm going to break this thing in apart so you can see. Oh, yeah. The OH goes here to make the fatty acid. And the H attaches here to make the alcohols. But this is called hydrolysis. It's adding water across the bond. Put that in your notes. Adding water across the bond, and I'd also make additional notes to myself. When I add water across the bond, I add H plus to one part, OH minus to the other part. That's how it's added across the bond. And in this case, I put the OH onto the, you know, the lipid part, and that made this, and the H got added onto this oxygen part to make the alcohol. Now, this doesn't happen naturally, as I will know, because if I put water on top of that fat, like vegetable oil, would it even mix? No. So I need an enzyme. I need something to make this happen. It's a catalyst, right? It goes in, it makes it happen, then it steps out and can do it over and over again. So I'm going to introduce you to this. This is called an enzyme. You guys with me? Enzyme biological catalyst makes the reaction happens happen without being used up. You okay with that definition? Enzyme biological catalyst makes the reaction happen without being used up. And then I want to teach you a little bit about biochemistry naming. I broke apart a lipid. Enzymes get the ending ASE. Lipase breaks lipids. Follow. You'll, you'll see this trend throughout the, the semester. So if I'm thinking about, okay, what breaks apart sugar sucrose? 
sucrase breaks apart sugar, right? But you see what I'm saying? I'm going to see that trend. So this is the first introduction. Lipase is the enzyme. I hear ASC, I'm thinking enzyme. Biological catalyst. catalyst. The naming is very tied to what it's breaking. How does it break apart? Hydrolysis. That's another term. Adding water across an organic bond. Easy enough? So you can practice that a little bit. And if you get good enough to know which part of water goes to what, that's awesome. More power to you. Most of these will be represented for you. And all you'd have to go is, hey, before I add this, I added water. When I'm done, that water looks like it got added across here, then hydrolysis. That you'll know. But if you want to spend a little extra time and think about, does the OH go with this? You know, to this side, or does it go to this side? Yeah, that's good. Good stuff. And by the way, yeah, it comes back out as a product, too, right? Because I put it in, and then it kicks it back out. Now, you might hear hydrolysis talking about other small molecules, so keep your eyes open. It may not always be water, so just keep your eyes open, but usually it's that. Stuff? Cool. We'll probably better take a break and we'll we'll kind of keep going on these lipids for a minute. After break, something that loves water, right? It's a little bitty piece. So that's just one little piece. So these aren't skill. But most lipids have the ability because they have a little bit of both to them. Sometimes what they'll do is they'll take the fatty part and they'll surround it with the hydrophilic piece. And they'll actually surround it and then they'll put the water, the water loving piece on the outside and that's how it'll float, like in a water system. So this would be important for transport. And it's also important, like you'll see it sometimes. I mean, I, ooh, I should have brought some. Like, oh, you could do, I could do this. But you can see that sometimes when when fat globules get in water, sometimes they kind of glob up as opposed to stay flat. Oh, yeah. And that's, that's because they make what we call micelles. And the micelle concept looks differently throughout nature, but it shows up a lot. So whenever you hear the term micelle, right, you can think about, okay, whatever this molecule is, it's organizing in a sphere with probably a water-loving or water-hating side and a water-loving and water-hating side on the other. It's not always the way this is going. But this would be a micelle around solubilizing something that was water-hating. So this could surround a grease module, for example, with grease in the middle and then still float water because the outside is all water-loving. So just know the term micelle. So, here's your new group. So, here, here, think about what we've got so far. Right, we did the waxes, right? We did the triacylglycerides, we did the carboxylic acids. Yep, so this other group is a phospholipid. So, again, here's the piece, right? The big, long lipid chain, hydrocarbon chain. And then on the top, it's actually fairly polar. Like, it's ionic, even. So, this is very water loving. Right? These aren't like H bonds, they're not like dipoles, they're ions, so they're very water loving. And these are called phospholipids, and they're found in the walls of cells. Now, I have the full cell picture, and you're like, ah, oh, da, 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 da. I'm talking about this. I'm just talking about this. <laughs> it's the wall that surrounds the cell. Okay? And if I blew that up, I think I have that. There you go. Now I'm just focusing on the cell, right? I'm just, I'm, I'm doing a, can I get expand and look at that cell for a while, minute? I want to look at the cell wall. It would be this. Oh, okay. Now it's interesting because it goes water loving out. That faces the blood, makes it float. Water loving in because you have water content inside the cell. And then you have a lipid, hydrophobic, water resistant bilayer. And so things that move through here, especially if they're some sort of water or whatever, they have to go through passages. Because they don't naturally absorb through because it's, it's waterproof. 
right? And so you'll see channels in there, and that's what all this business is about. You got different channels. All right. So, what is that group now of your groups you've looked at? You go, okay, there's a phospholipid that makes cells. Consists of looks like a phosphate group. So if you look on polyatomic ions, it's a PO4. Only charge is a little different. It's not a three minus. Once it connects to these carbons, it knocks out two of the charges. And that's a, a long story. We're not going to get into it, but basically it reduces the charge a little bit. And it also has a, that's actually ammonium salt in there too, so it has a little bit, of, it's got a lot of charge in it. Okay? So there you go. Now here's another group. Now this is wild. This is totally different. Right? By structure, you're like, whoa, this just shift gears a lot. And again, remember, that's because the old school chemists, they were like, hey, if this comes out with oil, probably like a vegetable oil, then we're like, okay, it's a lipid, generically. Well, some of the ground up pieces came out like this, and it's cholesterol. But these are called sterols in general. And what will you see in the structure of a sterile? You'll see a lot of rings. That's where the hydrophobic piece is. See all the rings? And every once in a while, you see another group attached. In this case, you see an alcohol. All right? So cholesterol is actually part of the cell wall uniquely. So here it is. It's right in here part of the cell wall structure and what they think it does is it makes it rigid. Okay? So you need cholesterol in your in your cell walls. So a lot of people don't realize that they're like I need I actually do need cholesterol. Because you know sometimes in health and stuff they're like avoid cholesterol. It's like well no actually there is cholesterol in your body. It's an essential part. It makes your cell walls rigid so they're not just flexible gooey. Okay? Now, let me help you a little bit with the rigidity, right? What does a ring do, right? So a ring is like this, right? I mean, if it's a straight chain, it's like this. It can move in all directions, and a ring does like this, and it locks it down, and that's why it makes it rigid. So the presence of rings kind of locks down this, and especially if it's like this, because it could do, do double bonds rotate. No, so that piece is totally locked. Like, it's, it's not going anywhere, right? So that's important. Okay. Yeah, and so again, I, I thought about cholesterol as this. You have an alcohol. That's water-loving. But there's so little of it compared to the hydrophobic region, it's considered hydrophobic overall. So there's that. Now look, here's other sterols. See the similarity in structure? Lots of rings. These are unique. They have like alcohols, but this also has this group. Who could name that group? Look on your chart. Ketone? Ketone, yeah, yay. I see the double bond C, and then I look on either side, I go, oh, no, no OH, no O's. In fact, it's hydrocarbons, ketone. So this is really interesting. These are actually hormones, which are chemical messengers, right? They're like, they actually tell the body to do something. So these are the famous ones, estradiol and testosterone, right? So funny, because but you know, they're all part of the sterol group. And you can uh, kind of hear it in the word, all, alcohol, and that's one of the groups that's part of this. The sterols have the rings and the alcohol group. And what are their functions? Well, you've got cholesterol, which is structural, cell wall, and then the chemical messengers, the hormones. So lipids have got a lot going on, right? Long-term energy storage, protection, as far as waxes go, protection from chemicals, like protection from shock, right? And now we're looking at this, where it's like, oh, chemical messenger, <laughs> and structural. It's like, oh my gosh, what do they not do? So it's a lot. 
Now the nice thing is the other three groups are pretty, they don't have so they don't have such a wide category. Carbohydrates, proteins, not so wide. All right. There's also sterols that are used for transport. So these are bile acids. But do you see the sterol structure in there? You go, okay, I've got lots of rings with alcohols. Those are generally called sterols. So this is another function altogether. These are actually for transport. So when you talk about bile acid, you're basically thinking about something that transports lipids throughout the body. Why? Because lipids aren't going to dissolve in blood, because blood is water-based. Lipids don't like water. So if I need to move them through my body, I need something that kind of chaperones them through the body. And that's the bile acids. It's kind of, kind of biology type talk, right? A little bit. But now you have a little more insight about like, why do I look at this and think it might want to transport something through water? What do you see in here that says, okay, I now have a water loving side to me? What do you see in here? Hydrogen. Well, more specific, there's always hydrogen, right? Hydrogen. What is it? Hydrogen bond. Hydrogen bond, which is in what group on here? Is everybody agree with her? There's an H bond, an H bound to an O. And I'm just going to just review, if you have your functional groups in front of you, what is that group called? Down back to carbon, OH. Carbon. Alcohol. Alcohol. What about this one? Carboxylic acid. But still, H bond is prevalent. And the dipole. So once I start to stack these up, this is actually has it kind of has a water soluble component. So what this does is it starts to surround like this. It takes it can take multiple ones of this, but they this part can surround the, the lipid, and this part can go out towards the water. To make it transport. But now you understand that, right? That might not have been so obvious before. Make sense? So there we go. And also, they can get deprotonated, which makes it even a stronger charge. Right? Because now if that H is off and it's an O minus, this is an ion, and that's even stronger attraction to water. <coughs> so that's good. Good stuff. So you can imagine, I, I would ask you to understand this, right? Like you gotta be thinking like, how, what, what do I do? How do I pull this together? What do I need to know? Of the sterol, there's a few groups, right? Hormones, biological messengers, cholesterol, structural in the cell wall. And now we're talking about this, bile acids which is for transport of lipids, right? It surrounds lipids and transports them. Then the other thing I might say, if I drew the structure for you and I said, hey, could you identify the water-loving region? Could you circle the things I've circled and say, yeah, that loves the water. That's what makes it soluble in blood. Then if I said, hey, could you circle the lipid-loving region? Could you circle the part that's hydrophobic, right, that doesn't like water? Does that make sense? That's what I'd like you to be able to identify when you see this. Okay? And again, you can always run these slides to review when you're kind of thinking about those concepts. Okay, so we have a lot. There's the sterols. There's the triacylglycerides. There's the fatty acids. Oh, I missed the one. What did I miss too? Well, other group, a very unique group that's out of this lipid family. Cell walls made out of? Cholesterol. Cholesterol supports the cell wall, but the bulk of the cell wall is made out of phospholipids. So that's unique, right? That's a unique, there you go. There's your kind of your groupings. And a lot of, right? There's a lot of, so now we got them drawn. Let's see if we can kind of associate who with what. Shall we try it? Of these, we'll call this phospholipids. 
With, although it's a sterile, <coughs> legitimately sterile, but specifically bile acid, it has unique things, right? Also sterols, but we have cholesterol versus the hormones, right? Okay, so could we identify long-term storage? Who am I gonna tie that to out of all these structures? Triacylglycerols, right? Cool. Um, what about protection from shock or force? Triacylglycerols again? Okay, I agree with that. Protection from chemicals? Waxes, yay, where is that? Down there in the corner, okay, good. A broken down form of a triacylglycerol, it's ready to be transported. Fatty acid, cool. Waterproofing. Wax is good. Ubers to transport fatty acid. That's not, that's not biochemistry, right? I was like, wait, what? Yeah, who's that? Who moves the fatty acids through the body? Bile acids, good. What about heat insulation? Man, this winter I need more of this so I don't freeze at night. What's that? Phospholipids? Triacylglycerides again? Yeah, okay. Major com Now, how about major component of the cell wall, bilayer cell wall? Phospholipids, good, I like that. What about lens rigidity to the cell wall? Cholesterol. Hormones, chemical messengers. Testosterone. Oh, I did it twice. I meant yeah. to put estradiol. Yeah. Sorry. There you go. And then if I was to identify up there and go, okay, these are all sterols. I kind of have them linked, but I'm missing one. What's missing from my sterile grouping? Bile acid is also a type of sterile. How do I know? It's got the rings and it's got lots of alcohols. Correct? Now, beware because forthcoming, I'm gonna teach you about carbohydrates. They also have lots of alcohols, but they're littered with alcohols. I mean, there's alcohols, but it's like hanging out at the bar in reference to our early conversation. Carbohydrates are unique, like so alcohol -y. Okay, so just because this might be confusing and not well, I can't say not ring, because they do ring up. So that would be a little hard to discriminate between this, except this is, has a lot more hydrophobic region to it. Cool. So we're going to just get a couple, and we'll be done. I'm going to teach you just a couple of reactions to try some of those rights. Part two. Part one is lipolysis, which just basically means hydrolysis is a better word, right? Just taking a triacylglyceride and making it into a fatty acid by adding hydro, hydro, uh, water across the bonds, right? So we're gonna talk about how you make a soap. <coughs> and there we go. And then a saponif or my, my cell, which we've already talked about. Okay, so here's how you make soap. In this case, so do you understand what I've done with an R? Right, what does R mean? Hydrogen carbon. It's a, just a hydrocarbon chain, correct? We're talking about triacylglycerides, so are these little bitty hydrocarbon chains or big long ones? Long, they're 20 carbons long, 16 carbon long, they're big. But they're, they're in the way for what I'm just trying to show you right now, so I just simplified. Remember what we did with water earlier? We added water across the bond, right? But if you add sodium hydroxide with water, so this is technically a base, right? If I add a base in water, what happens? It's very, it's a little bit different. It splits the same way, but instead of making a carboxylic acid, it makes a salt. Same thing, glycerol is the other byproduct. It's like adding water across. So one way to think about it is this. It adds sodium, right onto this part of the bond and hydroxide onto here, it's kind of a similar thing, right? It makes the glycerol, but it also makes this. This is what's called a soap. 
Looks like a fatty acid, except it's not a carboxylic acid. It's a, we call that a carboxylate, but it's a, do you understand it's an ionic charge? The sodium is the other ion. Now what's unique about that? It's a lot more water soluble. A lot more water soluble. So how does that work? So I got some sort of something. Here's, here's a fatty acid. Like I spilled that on my floor, right? So what's going to happen is the soap's going to micelle it with the lipid part grabbing this and then that sodium plus hanging out here, right? The o mi OH minus. So if I was to be very specific, I don't know if that comes up in the slide, but it's, it's a little different. Because all of these, I'm not sure what the HI is. I'm a little confused, but anyway. These things, and every one of these are water lovers. Only different than carboxylic acids, right? Which are also water lovers. These are much more charged. So they're really more water loving, right? Ions are a bigger charge than the dipole, right? And just to remind you, oops. We do this to say it's partially, and then we do this to say full charge. Baby charge, 9 volt battery, big charge, 120 volts, like the wall socket, like big charge. So soaps have a lot more affinity for water, a lot more love for water. Got it? And that's how you make a soap. And it's really like, literally, it's as easy as making, and, and sodium hydroxide is lie, if you've ever like wanted to go to the store and just buy it oven cleaner has a lot of it in there that treated with just vegetable oil it makes this settles out makes this precipitate which literally is just cleaned and turned to soap it's kind of crazy and some people like into that they use their own <coughs> soap making. right anybody know soap makers anybody do it as a hobby or no no okay we used to have this uh <coughs> lab assistant at metro that that's what she did as a hobby. It's like you go into the lab and half, half of it was chemical prep and on the other side she's like, how oh, make it her soap. Wow, okay, that's fun. All right, so here comes the water. It obviously grabs the water-loving part. I don't know what happened to my little picture, but it's supposed to grab the water and leave with, maybe I should leave my hands off. This. There we go. Ah, leave myself, leave myself. Okay, make sense? Okay, cool. So of that, I just want you to realize the reactions that I'm asking are fairly simple. They look complicated, but you just break them down very simply. I've got the triacylglyceride. I add water across. That's a common thing the body does to take those and break them down. Using what enzyme? Like Lipase. Lipase, right? But on the other hand, you can do water with sodium hydroxide, it'll add sodium plus, and it'll make that other an O minus, and add OH to the propane, right? This is so then it makes glycerol again, which we know is actually propane triol, right? <coughs> or what we would actually call prop triol would be the proper name, okay? And that's how you make a soap. There you go. All right. And then the last part, <clears throat> I'm going to talk about fatty acids and that quite often they're either saturated, meaning they're all just straight carbon chains, or they're unsaturated with the alkenes in the carbon chains. So when you ever start hearing saturated versus unsaturated, is everybody clear? Saturated is the straight chains. Unsaturated means the doubles are present in that lipid chain. Is that okay? And then this is a very important point. In this biochemistry section, I'm gonna talk about the specificity of the body a little bit. The body makes only cis unsaturated. 
it does the higher energy form. And then I also, I've said it a few times, but I just want to reinforce this note. When you start doing that, it makes things ring up and it's almost like branching it. Okay, and I've said that a few times, and I don't, I wish I could demonstrate that. The problem is that I don't have enough double bonds in my kit anymore. I need, I need more of these, I'm a little short. So I'll have to get some, a bigger molecule and do that. But if I start building double bonds and put them in the cis configuration, that thing will start ringing on its own. Instead of being that straight long chain, now, if I keep it trans, though, it stays straight. It acts almost like an unsaturated, as far as this stuff we've been talking about yesterday and today, how closely it connects. So when I think cis, I would be making notes. It's like branching. And everything I know about IMF about branching is holds true. Branching going up, what's going on with the melting point, boiling point? Going down. Going down, which means things that were solid now, to, now start to become liquid. Okay, so if I go, oh, I've got unsaturated, it tends to be, those fats tend to be solid. Like if I cut a cadaver open and I found solid fat globules, you'd go, oh, those are unsaturated. But if there were liquid gooey parts, right, those would be saturated cis bonds in, there, in the fats. Okay? So, so you just kind of get you some ideas about this. Some things you hear about, palmitic acid, steric acid are the most common saturated acids. Now, I'll show you a little notation, but I'm not gonna hold you to this, but just so you're, in, just so you're informed. When they do a palmitic acid and they go a C60, zero, they're just basically saying it's 16 carbons long in the strand and there's no double bond. They're the most common saturated acids. Oleic and linoleic acids are the most common unsaturated ones. How many double bonds in this structure? One, and how many in this? Two. And these are things that are like oleic or like stuff that they make margarine out of and stuff like that. And then linoleic and, li and linoleic and linolenic Acids are essential in the human diet because the body does not synthesize them. And they are structural components in the cell membrane. They're like part of your cell membrane structure. So they're necessary to make the phospholipid. So I'm going to introduce you to one other term here, and that's essential, like an essential fatty acid. And we'll use that in more applications throughout the semester. So when you hear the word essential, it means it's needed in the body but it's not produced in the body. So I need to eat it. So I actually need linoleic and linolenic acids in my diet, which are found in vegetable oils, nuts, seeds, eggs, meats, beans, and avocados. I go without this, I don't have what I need to make some of my cell walls, somewhere in my diet. Now some of these are also essential, but my body can reproduce them which is cool. My body can make some of the fats it needs if it's not getting into the diet. Everybody okay with that? So what I call essential and non-essential, essential meaning I need it, it comes in the diet. Non-essential, I need it, that throws you off a little sometimes, but I can make it because that's why it's not essential because I can just produce it myself. So, kind of thinking about this. You guys with me? Here comes the fats. Maybe I eat it. Down it goes into my belly. It's going to get torn apart using what and what? So what's going to rip these apart and make them into carboxylic acids? Lipase and then a little bit of water, right? And that's the enzyme part. And then the bile salts can pick it up, right? And it can just transport it back throughout. That's where the bile kicks in. So that's just kind of a thought about how this all might be used. I might also consume straight up fatty acids, and that's fine. 
then I don't have to digest them so much and I can just bile acid can grab it and move it into where it needs to be used. Now, they're usually turned into single lipids, carboxylic acids, for use when they're transported and then they can be reassembled. The body's kind of cool that way too. So once I get out there and I'm ready to do fat storage, here's a picture of my fat. Yeah. Smile. No, I'm just kidding. But, are you with me? <laughs> so this is literally has been transported as carboxylic acid, got reassembled as needed for long-term storage, which is cool. Now the body also can take like old spent sugars and say, oh, okay, I'll also reassemble that as or these lipids, which is a, a long story. We don't do all that in here. Two things you might hear about low density lipoproteins. That's like that's a lipid, more lipids than protein. It can end up blocking arteries, and then you'll hear about high density lipoproteins. That's more proteins than lipids. That gets properly utilized and injected. Now, I, I'm kind of jumping ship on this, so I'll be a little careful with that LDL and HDL until we get to the protein piece. But it's just kind of an introduction early, and that is when you get a lot of LDLs, low density lipoproteins, that's kind of a dangerous thing. You need more HDLs because then they can take care of themselves. And so you can preview that, get it in your notes and start to process that and then we get to proteins, we can come back and visit that a little more. Okay? More cysts, the lower the melting point because it's like branching, right? More saturated or trans, the higher the melting point, more likely to be solid. But sadly, that tastes better. <laughs> just facts. So I'm going to just show you the kind of the last kind of concept, and then we'll be done. So now I have trans. Do you see the trans in the structure? It's on opposite sides. Now that's cis. And see how I'm starting to curl it. On its way to being ringed. All right? And then this thing, more cysts. And again, I'm just trying to show you hey, it's hard for these to stack because they're kind of starting to ring up. Those can stack nicely, so they might be more solid state. By the way, this is also easier to make energy wise, right? Remember, the trans is easier to make than the cysts. And then I'll do a little bit. So, I'm just gonna I'm gonna just show you a little bit the last little lesson here. So here's an idea, and this is what's happening. So if that the actual oil we're using is like peanut oil, so when you get natural peanut butter, you see it's solid and it's liquid. The liquid is natural, it's cis. The solid is natural, it's saturated. And then we always like trying to put them together. And they do mix a little bit and they hang for a minute because they're both hydrophobic, right? But then they tend to just re-separate back out and you're like, that gum. So some chemists, bad, bad on this one, said, hey, I know this reaction. I can hydrogenate it. What's that gonna do to all these doubles? Turn them into singles and then they're gonna stack. And then that oil is going away, right? It's pretty cool. And that's how you get to your jiffy, right? It's like never separates. It's like oh, this is awesome, right? Problem is that's about ninety-nine percent effective, and so that one percent kind of goes backwards, like it undoes. The problem is. And that's okay, this would be normal, this part, the 99%. But the problem we didn't realize was 1% goes backwards, but because it's easier energetically to end up trans, it doesn't go back to cis, it'll just go back this way. Right, the body's not doing it anymore. The body would make it this way, but if the catalyst that I used in the factory acting on the peanut butter reversed 1%, I'm gonna make some of this. My body goes, I don't even know what that is, because what does it make, cis or trans? It makes cis. It doesn't know what to do with a trans, so it's like, I can't do anything with this, and then it becomes a blockage. And so.